Good afternoon and welcome to Brain to Brain, our week-long series of conversations and presentations by brain science researchers at the University of Minnesota. I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager here at the Bell Museum, and over the next week you'll have a chance to meet scientists in the fields of psychology, neuroscience, and neurology. We are thrilled to collaborate with these researchers and learn more about their work, and we'll even have a chance to go inside their labs and see how their equipment works. The reason why we're celebrating brains all this week is because on Thursday, October 15th, the Bell Museum is debuting an original planetarium production called Mysteries of Our Brain. This new animated film is a new way to learn and see about your brain, um, and we'll be showcasing it all weekend long, and it will become part of our regular planetarium schedule. Before I introduce our special guests this afternoon, I'd like to thank Boston Scientific for their generous support of our brain-related programs and activities at the museum. But I'd also like to let everyone know that we will save some time for questions today. So if you have any, please post them in the comments on Facebook. In addition to this live stream, we'll be posting recorded videos to our website if you wanna view them later. So now it's time to introduce this afternoon's guests. Dr. Katie Cullen is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the director of the Children or of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division. She is joined today by her research colleagues in the Research on Adolescent Depression or RAD lab. Um, Alana, excuse me, Elena, <laughs> or no, I'm sorry, Alana Liesky is a research professional in the non-invasive neuromodulation laboratory supported by MinDrive brain conditions. She helps researchers at the University of Minnesota investigate non-invasive brain stimulation techniques and potential treatments for a range of neurological and psychi psychi uh, excuse me, psychiatric conditions. And Elena Newsine is a clinical research coordinator in the RAD lab. Dawson, we are also joined today by Dawson Hill and Mariah uh, uh, Luders, excuse me, who are also in the RAD, RAD, lab, ah, RAD lab researchers. <laughs> thank you so much. You've given me some tongue twisters today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Cullen, would you like to start things off? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Amber, for that introduction. So I'm, hi everyone, I'm Katie Cullen. I'm a child psychiatrist, which means that I'm a doctor who sees kids who have trouble with their mental health. Mental health has to do with the brain and especially related to our thoughts and feelings. So for example, the kinds of problems that I usually deal with are things like depression, anxiety, and other issues. Depression is where people feel really sad or down for a long time. Now, everybody feels dad, sad and down sometimes, but in depression, these feelings are a little more extreme. They can last a long time and they can get in the way of important things like school, relationships, and friends and family. So there's a lot of different mental health problems or challenges that kids can experience, but there's also a lot of different treatments that kids that are available to help kids feel better. So besides my work as a doctor, I'm also a scientist and I, my research focuses on depression in adolescence. And in my research, I've been trying to understand what is happening in the brain when teenagers get depression and how to make the brain more healthy again so that kids can feel better. All right, I am now going to share some slides. Oops, I first have to, yeah. Okay, can you see my slides, Amber? Not yet. It's going to happen, don't worry. All right, good? See them? And indeed see them now. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, why study adolescents? Why is our research focusing on teenagers? So a few reasons, first of all, we know there's lots of really important brain changes that are happening during this time period. At the same time, this is actually, it turns out a really important time for the onset of mental health problems. Um, a lot of things begin around this time. And so for example, um, it turns out that the average age of onset for any, any mental health problem is about 14. And the other thing is that Children and adolescents, because they're still going through brain development, have more what we call brain plasticity. And that means they're more changeable. Um, and we think that that's an, a really cool opportunity 
um, if we can just figure out more about how the brain works and how the brain develops, we might have a better opportunity to change the brain and get healthy brain development back on the right track. So in our lab, as Amber mentioned, we're, we're the RAD lab, Research on Adolescent Depression. We're studying how the brain changes during adolescence, how brain development might be off track when teens get depressed, and we're looking at new treatments to get healthy brain development back on track. And here's a picture of um, our, um, a bunch of people from um, our group having a party last summer when you were still allowed to have parties. Um, here's a picture of a, an MRI machine. A lot of our research involves brain imaging. And um, we use um, a, an MRI, which involves, which is a machine that has a big magnet and it can take pictures of the brain. So what we do here is it, it, people lie on this bed and they go into this tube and that allows these special pictures to be taken of the brain. And um, the pictures can look something like this. And here's me looking at a picture of a brain and you can see my friend's feet sticking out of the scanner in the top right picture of the picture there. I mentioned we're looking at new treatments and one of our studies is looking at the combination of mindful breathing and brain stimulation. So what is mindful breathing? That is where it's a type of practice where you focus your thoughts on just your breathing, nothing else but your breathing. And you do this for a few minutes each day. It's a practice. And it turns out that this is a type of meditation and meditation practices we know can have can help with things like making people feel more calm, helping with mood. So we're testing whether this helps with young people with depression, but we're also seeing if brain stimulation can help boost that effect a little bit. So um, in just a minute, you'll be learning, um, we're gonna learn from Alana and Elena, how some of the technology behind these kinds of techniques. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alana and Elena. Thank you. Oh, and I have to stop my screen share. Maybe, maybe you already did it for me, Amber. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. Um, I am happy to join you here today from the Pediatric Non-Invasive Neuromodulation Lab. And uh, we are here to show you some of the equipment the RAD Lab uses to study adolescent depression, as just was mentioned by Katie. So to start, I'm just going to show a few slides uh, that will give you a foundation for some of the equipment that we use in the lab. Um, and I just want to give a big shout out to MinDrive Brain Conditions, who supports our lab and makes this research possible for teams like the RAD Lab. So to get started, um, transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, is a non-invasive form of brain stimulation. And this means we don't need to use surgery or an implant. We can just go through the scalp to apply the stimulation. And just a small amount of electric current goes into the brain from electrodes on the surface of the scalp. And this electricity can actually change the brain activity happening in the underlying regions. And your brain also has its own electricity always happening. Another way that we can measure this non-invasively is electroencephalography, which is a very big word, but more commonly referred to as EEG. And um, we can actually measure this electrical activity from the surface of the scalp again. We don't need to break the skin. Um, so it's a relatively safe procedure, both of these. And we can look at our EEG data to measure brain responses. And um, here you can see some brain waves. And we can see how is the brain responding to things like a sound or a picture, which we sometimes call events. And you can see here, um, one of the things we look at is an ERP, or event-related potential. And this is the general shape of an ERP. And it's just an average of many brain responses. So now we can get started showing you some of the equipment. All right. So this is our TDCS cap. It goes right on your head, kind of like a swim cap. And you can see we have these sponge electrodes inside of the cap. And so I'm just going to go ahead and put this on Elena. And we can just easily put this right onto their head. Great. Straighten it out. 
and it velcros under very much like a swim cap you can see. <laughs> and then here is our TDCS device. Um, it's just a small little device with a battery in it. And this actually just velcros to the back of the TDCS cap, just like so. And we can just clip in these cables. And they will supply the electrical current that will flow through those electrodes. And also, um, we can pair the stimulation with a task like mindful breathing to enhance the effects of the task alone. And so this is TDCS. Now let's get started with EEG. So EEG will be a little bit um, messier. So I'm gonna get a towel on Elena here. <laughs> I'm just slightly going to adjust our screen. Great. All right. And so right now the cap is soaking in some solution. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put this on her head. So would you close your eyes for me? Oh, <laughs> EEG requires a little bit of adjustment here. So if you don't mind. And right now I'm just adjusting some face straps, um, trying to get a snug fit. And we're trying to wiggle these electrodes so they're actually touching the scalp. Great. And now it's more difficult when people are wearing a mask, but um, you can see we make do. All right. So this process can take um, up to 10 minutes in order to get a really good signal. But I just want to give you guys an example of what some brain waves would look like. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you can see the actual data as it's being recorded. Great. So you can see, huh? oh, yes, let's make that a little bigger too. As you can see, um, we can actually see the brain activity in real time. And the thing about EEG is we are recording brain waves, but we're also recording muscle activity. So if you wanna blink for us a few times, you can see um, these disruptions in our signal are her blinks. So when we would go through our data later, we would remove those. But um, that is, a basic demonstration of TDCS and EEG. So I can pass it on to Dawson and Mariah, and they are going to show you an MRI scan. Thank you so much, Alana and Elena, for being uh, wonderful TDCS and EEG people. Um, so I'm gonna I'm here to talk about the MRI, and behind me we have a mock MRI scanner. So it's not a real scanner. Um, because if we were near a real scanner right now, we could not have any metal. I could not have my computer here right now. So very good that we're not inside of a real scanner. Um, but I work in the Rad Lab and I help with a lot of our MRI scans. And part of my job is to conduct the MRI scans for our participants. And this mock scanner is used for people who may feel potentially nervous um, about the, the scan and, and doing the scan procedure. So, um, what I do when I do the MRI scans is I get everyone set up, I bring them here, and I, I tell them what to expect when they're in the MRI. So with the MRI, as, as Dr. Cullen mentioned, is it generates pictures of your brain, and 
The magnetic resonance imaging is what MRI stands for, and it uses the body's natural magnetic properties to produce detailed images from any part of the body. So we're interested in the brain, so we always want to look at the brain. And when the body is placed in a strong magnetic field, such as an MRI scanner, your brain's protons all line up, either up or down, and that's how we generate images. And when you're in the scanner, it's really, really important that you stay still. So if you stay still, we get a wonderful brain picture like this, and that's what I, I ask of all of our participants, or do you stay still during the scanner? Because then we can get nice, beautiful brain pictures like this. This may not seem beautiful to all of you, but for me, an MRI researcher, this is a beautiful picture. Um, but if you move around a lot, we get a less than beautiful picture uh, right here. You can see we don't really see those nice, pretty brain structures as well. So most of our participants stay really still and we get these great pictures. And in this brain image here, you can see the different parts of the brain. You can see the frontal areas right here. Some of these areas in the occipital lobe help with vision and the cerebellum help with your movement. But those are some of the things that we look at when we're getting an MRI scan. Um, and what our lab uses these images for is we collect this data and we look at it and then later we analyze the data and see if we can better understand the brain changes that are happening in mental health disorders. And like Dr. Colin mentioned, specifically depression and also non-suicidal self-injury. So um, I think the next part is Mariah is gonna be our mock participant. And I'm just kind of gonna walk through uh, what it's like to get set up in the scanner. All right, as Mariah is getting set up, yeah, you can go ahead and uh, lie down, Mariah. So when I have a participant, I bring, them, I bring them in here. And the first thing I do is I get them hearing protection because the MRI is really, really loud. Yep, maybe can scoot back a little bit more. And I guide their head back just like that because the MRI is really, really loud. Um, there's a lot of beeping and buzzing. So we give them earbuds to protect them, protect their ears. And Mariah is laying down right here. And the next thing I would do is once, once she's all set up, I get this right here, this fancy dancy helmet. And this is the head coil. And this tells the MRI where exactly to take the picture. And since we're interested in the brain, it'll go like this right on her head like so, and that is how we take that picture. And then I go on the other side, I walk across that wall, I press a few buttons, click a few things, and we generate those awesome pictures. So unfortunately, I can't show live images of a brain being uh, scanned, but um, like, like Alana and Alayda just did with the TDCS and the EEG, but um, that is the scan procedure. And it's a really, really important part about the research that we do. And I think it's really cool, I love doing it. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it off to Amber. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, all of you, for sharing your research and your labs and, and how they all work. Um, we, um, we are kind of waiting for some questions and stuff to, to roll in this afternoon. Um, I do want to first apologize to Mariah. Mariah, I totally said your name wrong earlier. It's Mariah Kruger. <laughs> I, I misplaced my notes and I totally messed that up. But um, one, of the, one of the questions that, that we had kind of talked about is, um, especially in the study of adolescence, and I can, I can toss this back to Dr. Cullen or to any of you, is a, a lot of times people are really interested in when the brain actually stops developing. Can you explore that topic a little bit more? Sure. So actually the brain keeps developing all through the lifespan. We have important changes that we focus on a lot in adolescent period, um, but there are also tons of brain changes that are happening, you know, during infancy, during childhood, and then even into throughout adulthood and even in, in late adulthood. So I think that we think about brain development as a whole um, lifespan process. Um, but we um, really think that some of the most important changes that are happening during the adolescent period are um, things like um, more advanced thinking and decision making processes that are mediated by the, the frontal lobe. The, the forward part of the frontal lobe is thought to be the most um, advanced and the most um, the last one to kind of get polished off and finished. And, and um, a lot of what's happening, too, is um, there's both thinning and thickening of different things and, and refinement of brain connection. So the way that the cells are connected to each other and communicating with each other are some of the main changes that are happening in adolescence and then onward too. 
All right, thank you for that. Um, I guess I have a, a, another question that's that's maybe relevant to our, our current situation. Um, and, and I noticed that all of you that are, are working in a medical office, you're, you're and in close proximity, you're all masked up. We obviously have a very different situation going on right now with research and with public health. Um, what are some ways that people can help or can work to keep their brains and their minds healthy during this pandemic? Great question. So, um, and I don't want to mean to speak for everyone. I'll take this and see if other people have comments, but this is something we've been thinking about a lot. And in fact, we one of our research studies is looking at, um, at mental health during the pandemic in adolescence, but this has been a really stressful time for everybody. We're cut off from our friends, from our usual fun things that we're doing. So it's really important to, to do what we can to, to stay healthy and things that we really recommend are, um, first of all, um, you know, things, basic things, making sure you get enough sleep, making sure you're eating right, eating healthy, um, and, and sleep, not just enough, but at the right time, it's, 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 it's really tempting during the, when you don't have a, a normal schedule to kind of sleep in and, and, um, and then go to bed late. But the problem there is, especially when our days are getting shorter, that you miss out on daylight. And it's really important to have enough sunlight um, for our mental health. So getting enough sleep at the right time, getting lots of sunlight, being outside and getting exercise. Exercise is, a, is really great for the brain. There's things that exercise triggers in terms of um, chemicals that make us feel happier in the moment, but there's also changes, chemical changes that um, actually promote brain growth and brain um, healthy brain development. So exercise is incredibly protective for our mental health as well. The last thing I would say is connectedness, making sure we stay. It's, it's uh, dangerous to, to be isolated during the pandemic. We're not seeing, like I said, we don't have our usual way of connecting with people. And somehow we've got to find ways to um, still maintain our relationships and feel like we can support each other and connect with each other. Yeah, and just to tack on to what Katie said, I would say um, just making sure to cultivate and maintain your typical coping mechanisms so that you're engaging in things that make you happy, whether it be listening to good music or writing poetry, reading books, whatever it may be, even if we are isolated from our relationships some of the time, we still can do things on our own that make us feel better. That's great. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm just pulling up one of the questions. We did have a question come in from an audience member. Um, Robin is wondering if you see changes in an adolescent brain um, with, um, with the onset of certain hormones and the onset of puberty. Great question. Yeah, that's been studied a lot by some of our colleagues. And um, there are, we know that there are changes um, that happen together with, um, with puberty. And we also know that, that um, that, for example, brain development is really different in boys versus girls. So, um, and and um, those hormones really do have a shaping effect on on brain development. So, great question, and the answer is yes. Um, but I would say there's still tons and tons to to be learned, and learning about sex and puberty and the, the effects that those have on development is definitely still in progress. But we, with respect to depression, we know that the, the rate of depression really spikes after um, puberty comes. And so we really, and, and that's also when it begins to be more common in girls versus boys during childhood, it's similar prevalence. And then in, after puberty and all the way through um, adulthood, um, it's more common in girls and women. So we, we know that there's a, a something going on with sex hormones, but we don't, we're still really learning the exact mechanisms. Thank you. Um, Olga is also wondering um, about um, something that, that unfortunately affects a lot of, of, of teenagers and that is an anorexia and wondering if that is something that disrupts normal brain development um, in those teenagers. Absolutely. Anorexia is a disorder where um, people um, don't eat enough. And uh, they, um, in this, this is a type of um, problem where um, people get kind of, they start to get really concerned about their weight and they, they think they might think they're, you know, fat or something when they're really not. And then they 
kind of lose weight and lose weight and lose weight. They'll get really underweight and that is not good for the brain. The brain needs um, adequate nutrition to operate well. And um, so um, it can be very, very hard on the brain to um, during, especially when we're severely malnourished. Um, so it's a um, it's really a priority when when um, someone's experiencing anorexia during the development during the developing years is to really um, restore restore that nutrition and, and weight so that the brain can um, keep developing healthily. Yeah, I can add on to that a little bit too. That's one thing that a lot of hospitals have been doing research on now too is uh, some of the physical effects you can see in anorexia nervosa um, or just anorexia is you can see when the malnourishment comes, there's different parts and muscles in the brain that um, will be affected. Uh, our brain is composed of a lot of fat. Um, and so when we're not getting like that adequate nutrition, um, you can actually like have an increase in, in some of those symptoms. Um, yeah, and, and going along with the changes in puberty as well, there's a huge difference seen between men and women um, with that diagnosis of eating disorders, um, and it especially spikes after that age of 14. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariah and Dr. Cullen. Um, before we head out for the day, um, we are at the end of our school day, and we hope that there are some young students and hopefully some budding scientists and researchers watching this program. Um, so I was hoping that we could just take a turn with each of you, and you could you could just briefly tell us a little bit more about what you got, what got you interested in your research, or what got you interested in 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 pursuing this particular type of schooling. Great. Hey, I can start. Great. Cool. Um, so I am interested in uh, mental health research and specifically interested in psychiatry. Uh, I am interested in becoming a psychiatrist like Dr. Cullen someday. And I, up to this point in, in my undergraduate, I went, I went here to the U. I, after about two years of undergrad in my sophomore year, I learned about research and the cool things you can do with research and all about it. And I was just fascinated by it. And it was truly just a Google search and then and Katie's name popped up and I, I saw cool studies that were being done by Katie and, and the rest of this team. And that's how I got involved. And I, I got involved as an undergraduate researcher. And as time has gone on, I've gotten more and more interested and had more opportunities to get involved with these MRI scans like this. And now I'm, I'm doing some of the research myself. So that's been my journey so far is completing undergrad and now I'm in the process of applying to medical school to hopefully become a psych psychiatrist and scientist uh, later on in my career. Mariah, do you want to go next? Oh, um, well, that's really cool. I, I'm kind of along the same lines as Dawson. I, I was fortunate enough to come across some of Dr. Katie Collins' work. Um, I think now, especially for so many people, that interconnection between um, just the brain and body is becoming uh, a lot more important and there's just fascinating research coming out all the time. So I'm interested in learning more about that and being able to participate um, in some of that research going on like right here at the Rad Lab. Great. Alana? Hi, yes, I um, had always had an interest in mental illness and discovering potential new treatments and I actually went to the University of Minnesota here um, for undergrad and did a psychology major with a neuroscience minor. And after graduation, I kind of had a moment of what do I want to do? Um, I have not pursued grad school yet, but it's on the horizon for me, I believe. And I applied for a job here in the non-invasive neuromodulation lab and got the chance to try these new um, brain stimulation techniques that I think really have potential to help people, especially for treatment resistant depression and a whole range of other conditions as well. So it's really been a privilege to work here. Um, I completed my undergraduate degree at Carleton College. And during that time, I also worked in a behavioral neuroscience lab for about three years of my undergrad. 
Um, so when I left, I kind of wanted to get back into clinical care a little bit more. I thought I might want to be a therapist and I wanted to explore the field of psychology the best that I could. Um, so I actually worked with vulnerable populations with mental illnesses and persistent and severe illnesses, um, specifically mostly schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. Um, and that was just an amazing opportunity to work with that population. And it really made me want to be the best advocate I could be for them. Um, and so I went back into research, trying to make more of an impact um, on finding novel treatments, like Lana was saying, um, to really improve their life. Um, and I'm currently now pursuing a master's degree in public health policy administration so that I can um, potentially work my way up and kind of try and limit the um, divide between research and practice such that clinical care is at the forefront of um, research advance. So that's where I'm at and how I wound up in the Red Lab. Thank you. Do we have time for me, Amber? Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, um, my training um, was, I, so after college, I went to medical school, that's four years, and then training for child, for psychiatry is four years, and then training for child psychiatry was another two years. And then research training, I had just one year of research training that was specific for that, but it's really just a lifetime of study and training. And don't be dissuaded by that though, because every year is more fun than the year before that. And it is just, um, I personally think um, to all um, to all you young people out there, you know, when you're learning, that's the best type of life you have. You, the more um, you can be learning new things, the more fun it is and the more rewarding. So um, we really need young people <laughs> to, to be coming into fields like this. We need more people um, learning how to think, thinking about mental health, both from um, a care perspective, helping kids that need um, uh, people to take care of them, but also from a science perspective. So um, thanks for tuning in and giving us your attention because we really hope that more kids will um, choose to study these kinds of things in the future. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I want to thank all of you today for um, sharing your research and your labs um, and your interests with us and, um, and helping, our, helping our audience to learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing at the University of Minnesota. Um, and thanks again to our audience for joining us for today's installment of Brain to Brain. Uh, we would like to provide special thanks to Boston Scientific for their support of brain-related programs and activities happening virtually and in person at the Bell Museum. Uh, we hope that you can join us again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Our next uh, research uh, talk is going to be um, helping us to better understand tobacco addiction. And I have posted the link to the entire Brain to Brain schedule in the comments if you want to learn a little bit more. Uh, so thank you once again to all of our researchers and to our audience. We hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Amber.